All right, I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to our talk. My name is Nick and I'm the president of the Cambridge Society for Economic Pluralism. CSEP aims to examine pressing economic issues like poverty, inequality and sustainability by drawing from both a range of disciplines, the broach humanities, the social and political sciences, as well as alternative schools of economic thought. This evening, we're honored to welcome back Daniela Gabor, Professor of Economics and Macro Finance at UWE Bristol, and Dr. Benjamin Braun, Political Economist at the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Societies, to examine the entanglement between central banking, macroeconomic policy, and private finance. The political and financial movers of global policy, including names like John Kerry, Mark Carney, and Larry Fink, have all declared the marshalling of hundreds of trillions of dollars of private finance to confront the climate crisis. In contrast, policy favoring green assets by central banks remains controversial, whilst a fiscal response commensurate with the threat seems similarly unlikely to come to pass. And so it seems that, as a recent article from Adam Tooze is entitled, the COP26 message was that we are trusting big business, not states, to fix the climate crisis. Yet, as our speaker's research reveals, the role of the state, although perhaps obscured, is far from absent. Indeed, understanding the relationship between central banking and private finance is essential to examining these institutions' current operations and projecting directions for reform. In this talk, Dr. Braun and Professor Gabor will examine different perspectives on the path to decarbonization, from the Wall Street consensus financial capitalism with de-risking to the ecological Leninist advocacy for central planning of some description. Central to any path is a coherent macrofinancial regime, which is constituted by the organization of financial actors, the money creation process, and the role of sovereign debt, amongst other things. Our speakers will share their thoughts for about 30 minutes, after which we will turn to audience questions. Please type an outline of the question in the chat, then I'll invite you to unmute yourself and ask it to the speakers directly. Whilst I'm sure many of your own ruminations deserve to be the focus of some discussion, tonight is of course all about our two brilliant speakers, so please exercise brevity. With that out of the way, I would love to cede the virtual floor to Dr. Braun to begin. Please take it away. All right, I think Daniela will begin. Yes, this is Daniela and Ben. Uh, we, we get rid of the titles for now. Um, and we're going to talk to you about um, pathways to decarbonization or what we call green macrofinance regimes, and, and we'll define them in a second. And Ben has very kindly offered to click to the next slide. So um, um, as I'm sure mo men, most of you or all of you are aware, there are uh, very interesting debates going on on what do the pathways to decarbonization look like. And um, in the conversations that Ben and I have had, uh, he uh, uh, has come up with a very interesting way of, of uh, typologizing in, in a nutshell and with some, of course, with some assumptions, uh, the, the various positions that we, we have seen over the last uh, few years. Um, and it, the, those start with the positions that start with economists. And of course, not all economists are the same, but most economists would argue that uh, uh, to reach uh, decarbonization, probably the most effective way would be to, um, to raise uh, carbon prices uh, to levels that are um, appropriate to disincentivize um, high carbon activities. Then there is the Wall Street solution um, that I call the Wall Street consensus, which says, well, yes, uh, uh, the solution is private finance, um, and uh, we can rely on the hundreds of, of trillions that private finance has, as Mark Carney put at the COP26, but just that just needs a little bit of help uh, from the state in the form of de-risking in order to help uh, change the risk return um, profile on, on, on assets um, and on long-term investments in um, low carbon activities because at the moment those risk return profiles are simply not sometimes um, do not make economic sense and therefore disincentivize uh, investment. 
Then there is the environmental movement. And here we are uh, basically uh, putting a, a very broad umbrella on, on the environmental movement uh, and uh, to, to um, assume that everybody wants the growth. Of course, um, that's, that's a very um, uh, strict assumption. Whereas left Keynesians, um, and some people would uh, number at least myself, if not uh, Ben, within, uh, within that category, left Keynesians have argued that what we need is uh, a lot more public investment, that uh, to get the low carbon transition that we want, uh, we can do it with green growth, uh, but uh, we cannot externalize it to the, the private finance uh, or to simply carbon pricing. What we need is a, a significant uh, program of, of public investment, green industrial policy. And then there are, a, and this is uh, the, the, the matter of some joking between us in the sense that um, uh, we, we thought uh, our previous uh, intent to give you this seminar was sabotaged by some Leninists or, or some anti-Leninists, we're not quite sure, but there are proposals that, come, that have been described as ecological Leninism, uh, but that's not necessarily the only label that it, uh, that it requires or it, it needs which argues that you cannot uh, simply have uh, the, the scale of the transformation of the economic system that is required for, to deal with the climate crisis requires some form of, of uh, planning or very, very significant uh, state intervention in economic activities way beyond just simply public investment. So in a sense, we, we think that these are the broad five proposals. There are some overlaps between them, of course, but these are the broad five alternatives to how you could uh, achieve, or at least the political pro programs and narratives of how the path to, to decarbonization should look like. But typically these proposals um, have, or the debates around these proposals have uh, focused mostly on the what and not, not so much on uh, the obstacles, the actors involved, the questions of power and, and redistribution. And what we argue uh, in this presentation, and we we're hoping to convince you, is that these are, in a sense, the political viability of these proposals has a lot to do with what we call uh, macrofinancial regimes. And I'll, I'll pass it on to Ben now. All right. Um, so before we... so. so in the rest of the presentation, we want to yeah, give some preliminary thoughts about what it would mean to think about alternative green macrofinancial regimes that are somewhat associated with these uh, five different programs. Um, but before we do that, just a quick word. This is not a literature review, but um, We've looked a little bit outside of our political economy and maybe economics, uh, mainstream economics bubble uh, that we know uh, better to see what people um, writing in the environmental politics or sustainability studies literature think about the state. And um, it turns out the concept of this, the green state exists um, in a book from 2004 by Eckersley. Uh, and there it is, I mean, the author, she, she argues that um, we need to look more closely at the state, but um, the skepticism uh, of uh, scholars working in this field towards the state is quite uh, well expressed in this in this first quote which says the notion of a green state might strike many people as a rather uh, psychotic uh, idea perhaps even a dangerous one and then there is a large green state literature where people um, engage with this book and this concept that we don't, don't go into here now um, but until this day or until very recently um, yeah, the, the finding in the second quote that um, this lit literature has not engaged in much detail with what we would call industrial policy, uh, indicative planning and so on, and the role of the state in the economy has remained true. There has been a bit of a turn, I think, in, in recent, in, in the last couple of years, as far as I can see that in the, in the literature. We would also be very interested in, in your thoughts and input, reading recommendations and so on. Um, on this from these other literatures. There's also the field of ecological economics, of course. And there, 
yeah, very important work has been done on weak comparability, econ economic incommensurability, which does point towards, and this is really key for our typology that we'll return to later, to point towards a need for non-market coordination slash planning. Um, because yes, uh, when there is weak comp comparability, the, the price system itself doesn't necessarily work at all and it comes down to certain political choices that need to be made. Overall, however, there's very little thought given to what we call macro finance. Um, and so Daniela will define this now. Yeah, so when when we think about how, how can one present or, or map out the political economy of alternative decarbonization um, pathways, we argue that we should start with a thinking through macrofinancial regimes. And we define these to mean institutional modes of creation and access to financial assets, including money. We're sort of modifying a definition from French institutionalism in order to be able to distinguish between two very broad macrofinancial regimes that we have had for the past uh, 60 to 70 years. Um, Keynesian capitalism and, and financial capitalism. And uh, we distinguish the, um, uh, these two macrofinancial regimes across various axes. First, um, in terms of what are the dominant financial actors, the process of money creation, the role of sovereign debt, the macrofinancial, uh, macroinstitutional architecture that supports um, the, the, the regime, and then the power and politics um, uh, at play there. And uh, very briefly, um, when it comes to Keynesian capitalism, uh, we argue, or, or historically, we, know, we see that banks and, and treasuries or ministries of finance have been um, uh, dominant, and they have been linked through what Benjamin uh, Lemoine calls the, the treasury circuit. In this system, money creation is basically uh, the banking system creating uh, bank deposits or IOUs. Um, whereas the role of the sovereign is to enter a social contract with the banking system because uh, the banking system provides uh, the money with the public, uh, the, the public with the, with the good of, of public money. Uh, and in the social contract, the sovereign uh, requires in return some or imposes some regulation on the banking system. Very important also, in part of the social contract, the sovereign does credit control and, and credit guidance. In other words, intervenes directly in the allocation of, um, uh, of credit, both through price and through quantity mechanisms. Uh, the role of sovereign debt in this system is to empower the state in the sense that it, it supports uh, developmental and transformative purposes or, or uh, aims of the state. In terms of the macroinstitutional architecture, what we have is fiscal dominance uh, in the sense that there is a hierarchy uh, between monetary and fiscal policy and the fiscal policy is carrying uh, the, the weight of, of institutional adjustment um, with monetary policy subordinated and typically oriented towards providing uh, the sovereign with, with low and stable interest rates. We're supporting um, indicative planning if there is any, and we're supporting the uh, process of um, state intervention in, in the allocation of credit. And we, we have mapped this in some detail just to con contrast it with the existing um, financial capitalism, which we think is the regime that uh, continues to characterize um, in modern capitalism, where we have uh, shadow banks and uh, market-based banking working together uh, in a relationship, in a close relationship with a central bank. And they, these are linked through uh, the market maker of last resort that the central bank provides to, uh, to the sort of the system of market-based finance. Money creation here is, is quite different in the sense that uh, shadow banks are creating a new distinctive type of systemic liabilities, which I, uh, with Jakob Westergaard, I call shadow money or repo IOUs. And uh, sovereign bonds have a macrofinancial role and, uh, and a money creation role here because they support uh, the moneyness or the at par convertibility of this shadow money or, or repo IOUs. And this is important, we argue, because it changes the nature of uh, sovereign debt and the role of sovereign debt in the system 
uh, the cost sovereign debt uh, no, is no longer simply, uh, or as in the Keynesian capitalist regime, uh, an instrument that empowers the state or supports developmental um, uh, or transformative purposes, but here sovereign debt fuels private money creation and fuels private uh, financial re uh, leverage via the, the repo market. And this has very significant consequences on the kind of central banking that can, that can be and has been done um, in, in crisis. If you look, for instance, at uh, both the, the COVID-19 pandemic reactions of the central bank, but even before that. And the contrast is even more sharper when you look at the macro institutional architecture, because the, here we have very clear monetary dominance in the sense that an independent central bank is uh, in the driving seat in the macro financial architecture. Uh, the speech, a recent speech from Isabel Schnabel makes a, a very clear point uh, and, and, a very, and very publicly states that this is the desirable distribution of, uh, of macroeconomic responsibilities uh, in the euro area and, and elsewhere. Uh, but what we notice uh, in this system is also that the central bank doesn't just simply implement interest rate decisions, but it has a role to de-risk uh, systemic liabilities like, uh, uh, like repo liabilities to de-risk sovereign bonds because of their macrofinancial role. And hand in hand with this, the Treasury or, or the Ministry of Finance um, has an, uh, an increasingly important role to de-risk the creation of new financial assets uh, that are required or demanded by the portfolio glut. And Ben will show you some very interesting empirics that he's put together on the, the portfolio glut, which, is, which we think is in a sense the driving force behind financial uh, capitalism in structural terms, but I'll let him talk you through the power and politics uh, of the two macrofinancial regimes and then uh, he'll get to the empirics. Yeah, so um, the question is not just whether it's a regime of fiscal dominance or monetary dominance. It's also a key question uh, what the balance between public power and, and, and private power, private sector power is. And um, as is, is clear from what Daniela already said, that the Keynesian regime is one of substantial financial repression. So, uh, the state imposes or the, the, the private financial sector is subordinated for the purpose of maximizing um, yeah, the policy space and, and uh, for the government and for public sector actors. And of course, what's not in here is for example, the international regime, which has been described by Raghi as an embedded liberalism um, or, of which the Bretton Woods system was the central part. So capital controls were also part of this, of this regime. Um, and all of this limits the power of, of finance in particular, but of course, uh, capital broadly, so uh, corporations, but also um, uh, the financial sector did exercise some uh, structural power um, to the extent that, uh, um, the traditional method of the investment strike was still available, of course, um, and uh, yeah, did, did to a certain extent maybe also play out in various um, moments. But the situation is very different under financial capitalism, where fi the financial sector in particular uh, exercises power. It, it is a magnificent lobbying force, of course. Sorry, um, it is a magnificent lobbying force, which is not in here, instrumental power. But then the financial sector also exercises infrastructural power vis-a-vis -vis the state. The central bank depends on the private financial system in order to govern the economy, in order to implement monetary policy. Um, and the financial sector also uh, exercises very substantial control-based structural power vis-a-vis non-financial firms in particular. So this is a, a version of uh, finance capital as described by uh, Hilferding, where uh, in Hilferding's um, times, banks exercised uh, structural power vis-a-vis -vis firms, and today it's banks, but also and especially what we call institutional capital pools. And uh, I'll show you quickly 
um, two figures or, or uh, two slides with uh, various figures to illustrate the importance of these institutional capital pools and what Daniela has called the portfolio glut. So here we're talking not about banks, but about um, pension funds, insurance companies, and asset managers. And here, and the, the driving force for a lot of this, um, uh, of these private savings are funded pension systems, and uh, they have spread around the world. By far the largest one is of course the United States. Um, and what you can see here is um, the pension fund assets as a share of GDP. The Y axis here is um, differs between countries. So we are here at 80% of GDP for the, for the US. And then you also see the asset allocation of pension funds. So uh, green is bonds. Uh, this purple here is equity, the two largest asset classes. And then mutual funds, of course, which invest in equity and bonds on behalf of these uh, uh, pension funds. But what you can see is that in many of these liberal market economies, but also in the Netherlands and in Switzerland, for example, and also in emerging uh, market economies, most notably Chile, of course, there has been yeah, a massive accumulation of these assets that um, uh, need to be invested somewhere. And then in order to make this point even more starkly is that uh, one, one needs to look at all of these three groups, pension funds, asset managers, and insurers, which are added up here in the orange category institutional capital pools. Please be aware there is a lot of double counting. Uh, asset managers manage, so about 50% of US mutual fund assets are pension fund assets. So there is a lot of double counting here, but uh, what we can see is that uh, institutional capital pools have uh, gained in importance relative to um, bank credit, of course, across the board. And then for individual countries, this is even undercounted, if you will. And that's why we've got uh, three, I think, offshore financial centers, four if you count the UK, uh, Ireland, Netherlands, and Luxembourg, uh, where, you know, in Luxembourg, uh, this is 8,000% of bank credit uh, is institutional capital pools. So these numbers might be even higher in, 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 in other countries uh, if we reallocate some of these um, assets that are managed in these jurisdictions for investors elsewhere. Now back to Daniela. Yes, yeah, so we, we promised your presentation on central banks uh, at, at the beginning. So we're, we're, we're zooming in a little bit on central banks because they are so, so important in the um, uh, institutional architecture of the financial capitalist macro financial regime. And uh, we want to compare the way in which we think about or, or the conventional monetary economics view of central banks with the critical macro finance view of central banks. To, just to give you a sense of why is it that we end up with particular proposals about how to green um, the economy and, and the financial system. And the conventional monetary economics view, you, you already know, uh, basically um, uh, it argues that governments need to restrain their macrofinancial powers, particularly their ability to um, spend and to issue, to issue debt. Uh, the role of inflation targeting regimes, which we see are binding again when there are inflationary pressures across uh, high income countries and mi middle income countries. The role of inflation targeting regime is to, to, to preserve and anchor independent central banks that, that work as institutional mechanisms that take care of price signals. In other words, that preserve the ability of private markets to allocate capital according to price signals. And what you need for that is to have low inflation. In other words, you don't want high inflation to basically disturb price signals. And this has been a, a, a reasoning to at least for in, in sort of neoliberal discourses to, to, to push for low price, uh, to, for low inflation as a way of activating and, uh, and preserving uh, price signaling. Uh, price signals matter because they coordinate uh, economic activity, including investment. Uh, and uh, the, the, 
the consequences, sort of direct consequences in this narrative for, for the financial sector regulation is that the social contract with the state that banks have because they, they create money and they can take leverage is to uh, ensure or that they don't take excessive risk because excessive risk taking also disturbs price signals by, by misallocating uh, resources. And um, that is very different. So this approach is different from uh, what, what uh, several of us have uh, termed critical macrofinance, which sort of goes back uh, to the Minskian insight that we have to take into account the evolving nature of the financial system in order to think through uh, the macrofinancial or, or, or macroeconomic institutional arrangements. And in this view, central banks are very different kinds of animals. Um, monetary policy and financial stability policy operates in and through financial markets, in particularly through repo markets. Um, there is a, the central bank plays a very important role in what the financial system looks like and responds to uh, evolutionary changes in, in finance. And what it, it sometimes shapes it directly. So for example, Ben has, has written uh, quite a, an interesting couple of papers on the role of central banks in, in promoting securitization markets, but central banks more generally have been promote, promoting market-based finance, uh, which they have tried to uh, transform from shadow banking, at least under the financial stability board agenda. Um, the, we have here uh, what we call the paradox of Keynes's uh, zombie uh, rentier in the sense that we have been for, a, uh, for quite a significant amount of time in uh, a low interest rate environment that should have killed according, should have been according to Keynes, uh, meant the death of the rentier, right? He wanted to have, he suggested that low interest rates would, would get rid of this zombie. But what we have seen precisely because what we argue is the power of, of private finance, both structural and, and infrastructural, what we have seen is the meta metamorphosis of central banks as vanguards of the de-risking state. In other words, the state works together with private finance to satisfy the portfolio glut by allowing it to create new systemic liabilities, new promises to pay that have moneyness in order to finance new asset classes. And the idea of the de-risking state, which um, uh, I've been writing about, is to, is to uh, engage or to conceptualize and theorize the, what we see empirically as a great push from private finance to create new asset classes, like for example, climate, and we'll talk about it in a second, uh, climate assets or, or nature as an asset class, infrastructure as an asset class, and uh, in Europe, uh, that's quite obvious, uh, housing as an asset class. And in this uh, critical macrofinance, we also emphasize is that all, despite the, the apparent independence of central banks and this nominal discourse of, of monetary uh, dominance, what we do see is uh, that fiscal, monetary, and financial policy are very tightly coupled, and, and we can uh, approach this coupling theoretically and conceptually through the concept of infrastructure power that, uh, that Ben has developed. All right, I think this is me. Um, so yeah, this is just a quick run through, I guess, through uh, infrastructure power, which uh, for those who are not familiar with this idea, the concept, of course, comes from uh, Michael Mann. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. The idea uh, in the way that I, I have used it is that public actors uh, provide the backstop, infrastru backstop infrastructure for the creation and trading of private credit money. On the other hand, private actors provide the infrastructure through which public monetary governance operates. So there is a, a tight coupling, uh, uh, a strong entanglement of these two sides at the core of the monetary and financial system. Um, so in banking and shadow banking. Um, now central bankers manage these infrastructural entanglements. Uh, and usually uh, in pursuit of monetary governability. So they have mandates and they have certain tools. And in order to um, achieve um, their goals with their relatively weak tools that they have, um, open market operations to steer inflation, um, they usually uh, in recent years or, or decades rather, um, 
well, mo monetary policy implementation has become more uh, market-based and uh, central banks have become steadily more interested in deep and liquid financial markets for the purpose of monetary policy implementation and transmission. Um, and so the infrastructural power of finance here is a manifestation of what uh, Michael Mann has called the two-way street nature of infrastructural power. For man, infrastructure power was something the state acquired um, over time as it uh, penetrated uh, civil society uh, more widely and deeply, um, uh, and the state became stronger over time. Uh, and and, and in, in, in the area of, well, at the core of the monetary and financial system, there is a, a feedback effect or the reverse effect also as treasuries and central banks become more dependent on the financial sector. The financial sector has power over, over these public actors, as can be seen, for example, when it comes to the ECB, um, let's say, taking the side of um, market-based finance in disputes about the regulation of securitization or uh, debates about the financial transactions tax that Daniela has also written about. Um, back to you. Yes, I, I feel like we are in a moment of ecologically coordinated uh, slide presentation. So uh, this allows us, this, this concept of um, infrastructural power allow us already, um, and infrastructural entanglements allow us to already to say something about the political economy of macrofinancial regime in the, and, and the role of the state actors in there because they seek to govern through um, um, financial markets that are deep and liquid. And this uh, emphasis on, on, on liquidity is, is very important. And, and there is a lot of polit um, political uh, work be, uh, done by the state in order to provide or support this liquidity. Um, but uh, we argue that this also translates into um, a um, infrastructural power and into, into structural power. And this also allows or, or uh, sets the, the scene for the what we call the resurrection of the, of the rentier in the sense that in a low interest rate regime, the, the rentiers or the shadow banks or the asset managers or the black rocks of the world are able to deploy infrastructural power in order to enlist the state in the risking systemic liabilities and in the risking new asset classes. And I've given the example of, of, already of climate, of nature or on housing. And if you followed very closely the COP26 debates on, on finance and uh, day three, in, in the, there was a finance day, you heard continuously the, the, the discourse of de-risking coming from Larry Fink, who was there, the, the, the head of BlackRock, coming from uh, big banks, from other asset managers, from institutional investors uh, that have uh, real, uh, that manage real money. The, the logic was the same uh, everywhere, which is we need the state to share the risks with us so we can uh, collectively provide through public-private partnerships uh, the kind of investments that are necessary for uh, the low carbon uh, transition. And this quote from John Kerry was uh, that uh, Kate Arnoff put on, on Twitter was quite powerful to me because for a while the Biden administration seemed to move away from what I call this, this uh, discourse of the risking I call the Wall Street consensus. And for a while the Biden administration seemed to move away from uh, the Wall Street consensus towards like very traditional public investment in infrastructure. And John Kerry marked the return of, or the, the, the institutional embedding of the Wall Street consensus in the discourse of, of the Biden administration by saying, what you need to do is blend the finance, the risk, the investment, and uh, create the capacity to have bankable deals. Bankable deals is another way of saying, create new asset classes for us uh, in order for, uh, for us to be able to invest. And that he argued the, he, uh, the private finance wants water asset classes, wants electricity asset classes, wants transportation asset classes. In a sense, you see the, the frontier of what can be an asset class becomes uh, or is pushed further and further towards the further commodification of, of social life and, and of public goods. So with, with this in mind, we think this is important to understand the past dependencies and the possibilities of, um, of what would macro, green macro financial regimes look like uh, but Ben will take you through uh, this last slide before we, we, we map out precisely the green macrofinancial regimes. 
Uh, yeah, again, just a little bit of um, context and taking a step back. What are we talking about even here? Um, we think that the discourse and thinking on macrofinancial regimes is, is shaped largely by the last war or the last wars, uh, which in, in the case of, of Keynesian capitalism is maybe literally a uh, World War II, but which for the current regime is, um, I mean, partly World War II, uh, but in the case of financial capitalism is mainly the war on inflation. And in recent years, the quest for financial stability, but these are problems or challenges that are fundamentally different, of course, from a challenge, challenge such as decarbonization and challenges such as yeah, um, uh, rapid economic development, industrial policy, and so on, um, are not very much on on yeah on the radar of, of, of a lot of the discussions and and let's say the the imagination is somewhat uh, limited when it comes when it comes to envisioning the role of the state in all of this. As a result, there is a lack of democratic deliberation on the institutional preconditions for large scale economic transformation. We have in recent years increasingly, I think, uh, gotten to a place where uh, people uh, and political actors and even parties are calling for new institutions because the old institutions are uh, not able to adjust sufficiently or um, uh, yeah, to deliver on these very different goals. So, for example, development banks um, and so on. And this is good, but not enough. I think someone is unmuted. Um, all right, sorry. Um, this is a start, but it is not quite enough. Uh, we need to think more holistically about the entire uh, macrofinancial regime because certain um, decisions uh, may imply other decisions, and then there are path dependencies, and macrofinancial regime choice today um, may have consequences in the future because we know as uh, social scientists and political economists that institutional choices have long term consequences and we really uh, cannot afford making big, big mistakes here. So uh, with that, uh, with those remarks, I think now we're getting to our last slide. Um, here it is. Yeah, so this is our uh, most intricate slide in some ways because it, it maps out what we think are the four potential macrofinancial, green macrofinancial regimes um, that uh, might, um, that, that are on the table and might uh, organize the low carbon transition. Um, the first one is carbon shock therapy and comes from this uh, economist um, a sort of uh, trust in, in price signals. And, and what it, the, the, this regime, what it basically argues is that if the political economy factors would come into place, then all we need is higher carbon prices. Uh, higher carbon prices was, would basically um, function as uh, um, signals uh, to markets and to investment uh, that uh, um, um, would organize the low carbon transition without any other um, interference. And, and this is a discourse that you hear very often in very different spaces com in, from, coming from people who are uh, critical of central banks, uh, uh, new greening strat strategies, coming from people who are um, uh, even more on, on the more progressive side who still believe car carbon prices would, would sort out um, or would, would make certain economic activities uh, unviable. <clears throat> And in this, in this um, sort of discourse, it's, it's very much, or this uh, macrofinancial regime is very much a status quo regime in the sense that there is very little institutional change envisaged as necessary for the low carbon transition. Um, there is not much role uh, given to, to financial regulation in general. The argument is, well, if you have carbon prices that are high enough, you don't, you don't need to do anything to, to finance, to green it. 
you've already worked out and, and resolved your price signals. And we are still remaining within the, the financial capitalist um, uh, regime of uh, monetary dominance and, and fiscal discipline. And moving into what we call the small green state, which is uh, in a sense what we are, get, we are getting some of it uh, today, uh, the idea is, okay, uh, carbon prices might not uh, increase sufficiently enough over the next uh, period because of political economy obstacles. Uh, so what is necessary in order to reallocate economic activity towards um, um, uh, low carbon sectors uh, is uh, the risking. Um, and the, 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 there is a specific role there because it's, a, it's an argument that, that has a lot to do or that privileges the role of private finance in driving the low carbon transition, then, uh, then there, are, um, there is some role given to financial regulation in the sense that it recognizes the importance of taxonomies that distinguish between green and dirty assets. These taxonomies are, are mostly private. Uh, the, the environmental, social, and governance uh, ratings or frameworks are typically used here. And there is a lot of emphasis on vo voluntary decarbonization in the sense that the, ar the argument is, well, once private finance gets the ESG right, then um, there will be um, voluntary decarbonization. The credit flows will reorient themselves from dirty towards uh, green credit creation. Um, the, there is a slight sort of marginal change in the, in the, in the logic of fiscal and monetary interactions in the sense that the central bank does or takes certain steps towards um, changing the direction of capital flows or, and, and credit creation through um, green asset de-risking. In other words, the central bank pr provides price support of some sorts uh, to, toward, towards green assets that it identifies either through private ESG uh, um, taxonomies or through its own uh, means. And if you look at the Bank of England, who has a, an environmental mandate now for, for some time, uh, it's using its own approach to, to identify um, uh, uh, renewable uh, or sorry, low energy and, and low carbon assets. Um, but the emphasis here is on a lot of carrots for, um, for um, uh, financial institutions and not many uh, sticks in the, in other words, not many penalties. Uh, and the, the logic is you have to just work again with price signals. You, you do what uh, we're, we're working on a paper with Katie Ked Kedward and Josh Ryan Collins, where we argue that this is soft credit guidance from central banks in the sense that what they say is, well, we just need to change the relative prices of dirty and uh, green credit creation and, uh, and externalize the, the responsibility of um, uh, financing the low carbon transition to the financial system. It just need the, the price signal needs to be adjusted. Uh, we have some uh, nationalization pressures here in the sense that we, in this system, you get stranded assets, uh, in theory, far more than you would get in, in, ca in carbon shock therapy. Although there are some, I'm, I'm not quite sure, there are some debates here, whether that's the case or not. And there, the central bank will have to assume the, the potentially the role of, of taking over stranded assets. And by stranded assets, I mean assets or like bonds or, uh, or loans um, um, that, uh, that have been issued by uh, uh, fossil fuel companies or high carbon companies uh, that because of the success of uh, of the decarbonization efforts, they become stranded in the sense that they can no longer be serviced. And then somebody needs to take them off the balance sheet of private financial institutions because that, that can create a financial stability risks. And uh, the, the central bank is the obvious uh, actor in here, since uh, again, the, uh, the role of the state in its fiscal capacities is very much limited uh, by, the, by the logic of fiscal discipline. Ben? Yes, and so uh, the third regi regime is, is um, we already are getting um, a good amount of the small green state regime. The, uh, the big green state, by contrast, is still some ways away um, in various respects. And, and yeah, the, the biggest difference, or the, you could draw a line here in the middle of this table and uh, 
Well, it, it's a continuum, but uh, the importance of prices as a coordination mechanism declines as you go from top to bottom here. And uh, the importance of non-market coordination through uh, the state increases, in other words, planning. And with the big green state, you get a lot more planning and less reliance on prices in, to, um, for the purpose of capital allocation. And so uh, for the purpose of um, in, uh, investment planning. So you don't need to, uh, you're not as dependent, or, let's say, on getting the prices right through a carbon price and uh, additional de-risking incentives for financial investors because the state will just say uh, which uh, sectors, technologies, uh, and so on it wants to be developed and can then steer capital uh, with much more direct instruments. And this is, of course, how this works. We know from uh, the very large uh, lit literature on the de developmental state and various de developmental state models and on industrial policy um, and so on. Um, this is not really um, yeah, a secret sauce. But of course, the situation is different. And, and then one can say a few more uh, specific things. The taxonomy uh, in this model uh, would probably be uh, have to be stronger and would have to be a public taxonomy. So uh, someone like the European Commission uh, would uh, legislate a taxonomy. Balance sheet decarbonization would not be voluntary but um, mandatory, this, this is the kind of uh, yeah, difference that in indicative planning would make. Um, financial actors could be told what to do uh, within certain limits. Uh, yeah, fiscal and monetary policy, there would be monetary fiscal coordination on a significant scale, uh, the two, so that would break up the, this fiscal discipline and monetary dominance would be replaced by monetary fiscal coordination because the demand on uh, the fiscal side would be much, much higher uh, because there would be a lot more green public investment. Uh, and yeah, as mentioned, uh, monetary, monetary policy would play a more active role and the central bank would play a more active role in, in quantitative credit guidance, much in the way um, um, as Eric Moni described it in his book, the role of the Banque uh, de France and other central banks in the, in the post-war decades when planning was actually, yeah, indicative planning done on a significant scale. There would be more nationalization pressures. Um, so nationalizing certain parts of the financial sector uh, might be advisable in this model um, because, uh, yeah, the idea would be to maximize the capacity of um, society and through the state to channel capital. And uh, this is not necessarily consistent with a large financial sector uh, which depends on high profits in order to uh, lend a lot. So um, yeah, y you could let uh, potentially some assets strand in this regime, even in the financial sector, because you're not as dependent on financial sector profitability for the financing of investment. Now, all of this is still much increased in the final uh, regime, the, which we call the green planning state. Uh, so uh, both of these states, all of these states are green and they go from small to large to very large. Um, and the key uh, feature in the last version is that there is a lot more planning, a lot more nationalization because private capitalists don't like uh, to be told what to do. And that's when uh, the nationalization pressure comes in, of course, for even non-financial sectors, certain strategic non-financial sectors, obviously the polluting ones, but also maybe the strategic uh, clean energy uh, ones, um, but that's totally up for debate. Financial uh, regulation would be much more geared towards financial repression, um, and there would likely be open monetary financing 
Now, very important here is that taxation and redistribution uh, can be done here potentially on a larger scale, again, because of um, uh, the profit motive uh, receding into the background. And that is also why this final regime, uh, in our view, is most consistent with a degrowth component to decarbonization. For all the other regimes, uh, really what you're aiming for is green growth. Um, and to the extent that you think that green growth is much more of an oxymoron than what, for example, big, street, big green state advocates are advocating, then um, the green planning state uh, may be your uh, macro financial regime of choice because degrowth in most uh, formulations requires a very large degree of redistribution in order to uh, maintain living standards um, and may require a much more radical reorientation of actual economic activity away from certain sectors that are deemed by society or the state uh, as not so relevant uh, for uh, well-being. And so all of this requires a lot more well, uh, planning and uh, capital coercion. So on this note, maybe, Daniela, maybe you have a, a final word. If not, I think we're done. No, I, I think we're happy to take questions. Just to note that most of the debates and the, the, the decarbonization policies that are, we have in place already and we will have in place for the next two to three years are within the small green state sort of um, uh, macrofinancial regime. And uh, possibly in the near future, given the scale of, of what I think would be debt crisis in middle and low income countries in the global south, we will see some carbon shock therapy coming there. So uh, we'll finish with this. Uh, sorry, Nick, we went a bit longer than your 30 minutes. Ben, just leave the slide maybe with the, with the typology there. And uh, we're happy to take questions, please. Yeah, I, uh, I can leave it here, Nick, maybe for a couple of minutes and then we can uh, stop sharing the screen. Yeah, or you can just leave it up there. I don't oh, all right, all right. Sure. So that should, that should all be good. Um, yeah, no, thanks so much for that. I think everybody, um, just, despite the sabotage beforehand, everybody was more than happy to, to wait for that brilliant presentation. Um, I just want to start off um, with reference to a post, I think, this morning or yesterday by someone of a Keynesian persuasion, uh, Josh Mason, who I'm sure you're quite familiar with, on climate policy from a Keynesian perspective. I was going to quote it at length, but I think given the time, I'll just try to summarize it. The basic idea is that we don't need to worry about incentivizing private finance and steering capital into these investments. We can just do it via the public sector balance sheets. Um, to quote, on the financing side, the private sector offers nothing, in rich countries at least. Public sector already borrows on more favorable terms than any private entity and has a much greater capacity to bear risk. So it struck me that not only was that Keynesian in a typical sense, but it also seemed to assume the essence of this bygone Keynesian macrofinancial regime, or perhaps as you've got it in your taxonomy here, the, the big green state. So with reference to the feasibility of that type of program, um, you also talk about the path dependencies. So uh, to what extent are we already set down this path dependency and towards the path of a small green state in the developed world and this carbon shock therapy, as you suggest, in some other regions? And to what extent is there perhaps scope for change if we come to a democratic decision that that is desirable? Well, I mean, I don't know if I, I can take it first. I've, I've, I've also read Josh's post and, um, of course, uh, my Keynesian sensitivities. And I, I've, I've seen that both Sheila Dow and Victoria Chick are here. If they are high, uh, it's, a, it's a quite intimidating to, uh, to be here with my former supervisor and, and my external examiner and both um, much better at Keynesian insights than I am. But what I would argue is reading that post, uh, of course, 
also to me highlights the importance of thinking about macrofinancial regimes, you know, because just laying out the, the, the macroeconomics of what the low carbon transition would look like is an important step, but in a sense ignores some important questions of uh, political power, of obstacles, and also of, I think, uh, I would add to this also the necessity that we don't just, to me, the imperative question of a macrofinancial regime is not only that you need more investment in low carbon activities um, for, the, for the structural transformation of the economy, but you also need to stop black procs and other financial institutions from continuing to create credit towards a high, um, fossil fuels and high carbon activities. And you need to stop private equity from, from uh, seeing this as a party to which they were invited and uh, to which they were not invited, but which they are going to crash by taking over this asset. So, uh, I think the focus on how to get green um, sometimes miss, misses out the fact that you also need to uh, stop uh, to penalize dirty and and that's why to me it's it's a it, we have to think more carefully through both the, the to, through the other aspects of a macro financial regime not just the 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 macro which I think Josh has done uh, I mean I'm, I I think uh, we have to debate with him uh, whether uh, they, he argues that uh, it. Uh, if we get the low carbon transition according to Keynesian insights, or if we organize it according to Keynesian insights, um, and direct credit where to, to sectors where there, there are some binding constraints and there is good credit rationing, so you don't put it everywhere, uh, then you have growth. I'm, I'm not entirely sure that we are looking at a period of high growth uh, ahead. Um, that we will we would have to to debate, but yeah. I guess that would be my answer. Ben also sent me the post this morning, so I'm sure he has some insights into, or some answer to it. Yeah, no, I think you uh, summarized summarized it well. The, the most important thing that I got from a quick reading, and I think we're on the same page on that at least, is is the the paradigm shift that Josh proposes uh, for the discourse on this is that this is a question of coordination, right? Uh, how is economic activity coordinated? Uh, and we do not need uh, prices for this particular problem because um, he doesn't entirely spell it out, I think, but the argument, the, the argu the, let's say the, the Austrian argument, uh, in favor of prices as um, it, it, the Hayekian argument in favor of prices as uh, in markets as information processing machines and is that only prices and market competition can get you to the most efficient solution. Uh, but as others have written recently, Cédric Durand, uh, for example, we don't need to get to the most efficient uh, solution Mm, it takes the market, uh, the Austrian process uh, also takes a lot of time, the Schumpeterian creative destruction process, and we don't have time and we know where we need to go, which is decarbonization and very fast and, uh, and we just need to find a different way of co coordinating economic activity and with the industrial policy um, and various developmental mechanisms about we about which we know a lot, uh, and maybe political economists know a lot more than a lot of economists who haven't read this literature. Um, yeah, we we can think beyond beyond prices for this. Brilliant. Um, the next question comes from Zoe, who is unable to ask it directly um, due to uh, technical problems. Uh, to quote, so does a greater pool of savings equal greater productive investments, or do additional savings relative to GDP drive asset bubbles? What does this mean for the link between savings and returns on investment, and what does this imply for nations relying on private pension savings for retirement? So a couple of questions in there on the linkage between saving and investment, which you can have a quite a Keynesian perspective on. I mean, I am. One for the economist. 
Yes, I'm, I'm tempted to, 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 smash, to, to, to snatch this from Ben before we disagree publicly, because I think to, to my mind, and as, a, as, a, as an economist, I tend to avoid the concept of savings because in the aggregate, because it, it confuses more than it clarifies. Yeah. And uh, I would want us to think more about the process of credit creation and savings as, a, as an outcome of that, or an, in the sense that investment comes first and, and savings comes after. I know that we have invited this question by discussing the, the pool of savings that comes from the portfolio GLAT, and, and in some sense it is true. There, are, there is wealth accumulation that we describe as, as private savings, um, uh, and that contributes to the portfolio GLAT, but um, there, are, there is no mechanic link between additional savings and asset bubbles. Um, and I would, I, would, I would not think about it like that. There are processes of credit creation that uh, in a sense respond to uh, the price of liquidity in the system set by the central bank. This, may, this, this generates asset bubbles and this generates some adjustments in, in wealth that we then might describe as um, uh, savings. There are, there are also quite interesting questions about um, do we need to have these pools of private wealth or, or can we have these pools of private wealth in scenarios in which, or in macrofinancial regimes, the, the low carbon transition. And my personal view in the plus parts of the financial sector in green there is that it is, it is probably inevitable that we will have to nationalize at least pension funds and insurance companies in order to be able to, to address the scale of stranded assets uh, that would that we would need to 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 have uh, if we are to rapidly transition towards a much lower fossil fuel uh, consumption and and lower lower carbon uh, economy. But this is already in a very speculative territory because we are not not very clear about, or at least I'm not aware of the of the quantitative uh, estimates there. But in general, Zoe, I I would suggest not to think of this in terms of savings conditioning or or or, or structuring. Uh, very much, as except for an umbrella term for the portfolio GLAT, but that is already, but that is causally produced by, by credit creation, and and I'll stop there. Uh, ben, did you want to add anything to that? No. All right then, moving on. Um, do you have time for say two more questions? Is that all good? All right, so our next question comes from Mattia, um, wants to say thanks for the fascinating talk. The question is, don't you fear that this green planning, using the L word, Leninist, states in the end may be inflationary like in the past? I mean, can I also suggest that we, there are a couple of people with their hands up and instead of you, Nick, read, re reading the questions, we can go and, and read them, but maybe let uh, Kevin and Andreas ask their yeah, questions. Yeah, sure. I would just yeah. say, I, I think it's very clear that in the, the last two macrofinancial regimes that we propose, inflation cannot be the first priority of the macroeconomic policy mix. Uh, and I mean, there are questions of whether there are inflationary pressures, but these will have to be accommodated uh, in, at least at levels higher than, than the ones we are proposed, pr prepared to, to, to accept today. Uh, Kevin, do you want to? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to thank you both for the presentation. It's very helpful. Uh, I come from a trade union in Canada that works on pensions, uh, and I want to endorse uh, all of the critical commentary and uh, uh, endorse Daniela's call for nationalizing the pension systems. Uh, my, my, I guess I would put my question, uh, I mean, I grapple with this because the pension funds as actors are problematic actors, and I and I view them as endorsing, you know, the first row and maybe parts of the second row of this typology that you have on the screen in a really politically damaging way, and in particular the pension fund use of ESG. And so my question is, you know, we we need to challenge the ESG formulation. I think much more aggressively and and thoughtfully in the way that I think you both are doing. Uh, but how can we do this? Because people are being overwhelmed, and I include in the labor movement 
people are being overwhelmed with this tidal wave of propaganda uh, around ESG being our, our path to uh, you know, addressing our climate challenge uh, without infringing or touching on uh, you know, the autonomy and sovereignty of pension funds as actors. Maybe I can uh, quickly uh, say, uh, thanks a lot. Um, this is a, a great point in question. Um, I'm also very yeah, skeptical of the role of, of, of pension funds and the possibility for, for them to yeah, be a pro progressive force uh, either from just an organized labor perspective uh, when it comes to uh, traditional organized labor concerns and or uh, when it comes to decarbonization now, um, both. And um, within the current macro financial regime that is, right? Um, they could of course be sources of patient capital under conditions where more or less they are nationalized and don't have to uh, compete in the, uh, the private financial system for returns and where people's old age income and in many cases survival even, at least let's say in, in, in some places uh, is dependent on maximizing returns today or in the next five years, right? Um, so when we are talking about a 30 year or a 50 year time horizon now for investments, um, and yeah, um, I, I'm. This would be a great moment in in many ways to revive the a debate about uh, organizing um, pay as you go uh, pension pension scheme. Um, uh, and increasingly, there are a lot of arguments floating around, including the ones made by Josh, I think, uh, this morning that could be used in that way. But as you say, the wave of propaganda is such that it's, I think, extremely hard to even communicate the fact that there are alternatives to a fully funded pension regime. And Andres, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Woody. Um, my camera's under working, sorry. Um, but thanks, Woody. Fascinating talk. So many issues. Um, just very, very briefly, question. Um, if we want to stay below two degrees of global warming, which regime do we need? I'd like, I mean, I think I know maybe where you stand, but I'd like to hear it. And then, and that's a bit of a side topic, but maybe if you have time, I would just be interested in, could you maybe very briefly just talk about the genesis of this infrastructural power of the, of the private sector, where does this come from? Because for me, it's just a bit the question, like why did the state give this power to the financial sector in the first place? Thanks. I, yes, thank you. That's that's a very good question. Probably green planning state, but uh, as Pavlos uh, points out, we also f fell in a little bit into the trap that we described the others of of uh, of of uh, committing or the sin that the others committed, which is that we we mapped out the content, but we didn't describe the political obstacles. And obviously, the political obstacles are are clear if you look at the degree of nationalization. Um, of moving from one to the other. Um, uh, the, the last two regimes, macrofinancial regimes, require a fundamental uh, uh, pushback towards the, both the structural and infrastructural power of, of private finance. And as Kevin points out, that is a, a very steep hill to climb. Uh, and, and we are not quite sure how to get the, the, the political support to climb it. Um, I will let Ben take the... I mean, I can, I can tell you the references, but uh, Ben probably can do a better job of explaining his um, infrastructural power if you want, or if not, we can- hey, This is a big, big question. Why, why does the financial sector become so powerful and um, why does the state yield uh, power? And yeah, I, I mean, my version of the infrastructure power argument for finance is, is really, made from a very rather narrow empirical perspective and much more can be said about, about this entanglement, right? I talk about the importance of the financial sector for the implementation of monetary policy, um, first and foremost, then, uh, then uh, others have been talking, uh, writing about the, the, the marketization of government 
finance, right? It wasn't always the case that governments went to the market in order to issue bonds. With a healthy degree of financial repression, you can also just um, uh, more or less mandate your own banks uh, to, to lend to you. You don't even have to have tradable bonds. That's the treasury circuit. Um, but of course, in the current system, yeah, we've moved very far away from this and this, the, the fact that we did, then we're basically talking about the neoliberal term and we would have to have a much, much longer uh, discussion about the reasons for this application of the state. Uh, but the extent to which state capacity in the macro financial realm, let's say, has been destroyed is probably, yeah, um, very much, um, well, not an entirely unintended outcome, but the scale of it is, is, is surely very large. And we're only now, I think, coming to grapple with this problem because so far it wasn't really noticed uh, so dramatically uh, that this capacity uh, for non-market, non-price, non-profit-led co economic coordination that is completely gone um, in many ways. And that is a, a very dramatic uh, loss in the current at the current juncture um, and then the fact that the neoliberal turn also involved shifting age old age risks for example to individuals and making them turning turning households into homeowners and owners of financial assets through uh, the privatization of pension systems all of this has created an enormously conservatizing yeah force let's say in the economy so that for example organized labor is in a very tough spot between a rock and a hard place if if you want because yeah workers pensions now depend on regime number one and two somehow surviving uh, unless the state makes a very good offer to, to these workers um, with a very radical um, shift in the pensions regime so there are many layers to this and uh, to answer maybe also to say one word about Pavlos's question in the chat, how to get from one to the other. Yeah, then uh, then then maybe at the end of this talk, we are back to uh, the L, L word from the beginning of the talk. Uh, I, I definitely don't know how, how we get from, from the top part of this to the bottom part. Um, maybe that's the topic for another discussion. All right, Bassani, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, thank you. So, so fascinating, uh, this discussion. And my question is linked to uh, the earlier person who just spoke um, around, uh, like, the your first slide basically showed different types of schools of thought and um, and their response to um, the, the, the climate or ecological crisis we face. Uh, and then you, you mentioned something around um, the, the Keynesian go for, for, for like green growth. And then, and then you have the ecological school that goes for, um, what's it, uh, degrowth or whatever, the environmental movement. And I'm just wondering in what you've, in the, in the the slide in the in the other slide that you've just shown on the topology, uh, which where would you say um, uh, how would because you 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 answered uh, that the, the 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 thing that was the the line that was highlighted in in red, um, I think it's green planning. Uh, that is what the regime you'd go for, and I'm wondering. To what extent that would in integrate um, the uh, the the questions, or uh, to what extent is that a green growth pathway, or uh, one that integrates issues of of, of ecological limits or, or, or degrowth or, or or the like? Um, which pathway are, are we? Or, yeah, which pathway does that suit? Daniela, you want to um, go for it? Um, no, go on. I'm not sure that I understood the question. Okay. Yeah, um, I think it was about mainly the, 
is the green planning state uh, consistent with growth or degrowth? And um, mm. uh, that's how I understood uh, your question, Basani. Um, yes, that's it. Is it, uh, is, it is it a green growth or a degrowth kind of paradigm? And yeah, the way I think uh, I would see it is that um, this is the only uh, one of these four regimes that uh, uh, through which a degrowth uh, agenda of some sort could be implemented, but uh, it is not necessarily a degrowth regime. So planning can be used to promote growth or it can be uh, used to uh, promote degrowth combined with the things that you need to do for degrowth uh, not to become um, too uh, socially disastrous, which is massive. Uh, uh, redistribution and, of course, yeah, um, both of economic activity from between economic sectors and economic activities, but also of um, wealth and income from. Uh, um, yeah, if I can, sorry, Ben, if I can add and and to respond to Christopher's comment in the in the chat as well. I mean, the reason why we took out degrowth from. Um, the, this uh, typology of green macrofinancial regimes uh, is Ben has convinced me that the degrowth is not per se macrofinancial regime. It, it, is, it can be an outcome and it is consistent in theory with any of the macrofinancial regimes can give you a degrowth uh, pathway. Only that I think, and, and Christopher points out that there are, there is a, in the degrowth literature, there are some uh, calls for what would look like carbon shock therapy if so in other words the first two at least would give you disorderly degrowth if if degrowth was somehow an a kind of side effect or a spillover of the particular policies that are implemented because to me carbon shock therapy can generate most likely will generate uh, uh, a disorderly degrowth uh, outcome um in the same way and and we, we use this concept that i developed with isabella weber we, we we take the inspiration from um, or from the parallels with Eastern Europe where you had 20% fall in, in, in GDP uh, over over the first few years of uh, transition from central from a centrally planned economy. I mean that's a, a degrowth pathway for at least four or five years um, which incidentally also destroyed the heavy polluting industry. So uh, I'm not sure how the growthers would think about that experience, but it certainly produced some of the outcomes, uh, but in a very disorderly way with very significant social costs um, and with, with very significant, um, 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 in a sense, um, negative consequences. So Basani, to, to summarize, you can have degrowth anywhere. Um, the only orderly degrowth that would uh, preserve some form of justice to the transition it, for me would be in the fourth scenario, also probably a big green state could do, could do that. Um, uh, only that the divide line in a sense is that the big green state remains to some extent a, um, a, a, a state that is um, reluctant to do significant amounts of, of central planning. And uh, I think we, we, sh we are probably five minutes over. I don't know if there are, Ben, if there are other questions. There was a really interesting question about uh, the state accountability from Peter. Um, and I think, Peter, I, I agree that the question of accountability, I mean, in a sense, we are moving the, com we are trying to move the conversations to towards thinking through what, what kind of a big green state or a, or a um, green planning state you could have that doesn't come with a very authoritarian bent, which is uh, at least the, the historical experience has gone into that direction and, and have, having democratic accountability is not a, an easy question in, in that sense. I don't think we, we view these macrofinancial regimes as, as, as in inherently democratically superior. It's not necessary that this is the case and we would have to think through very carefully of how you achieve um, uh, democratic accountability. I don't, I don't have a specific answer to that. I think it's, a, it's an important thing to, to uh, bear in mind um, that big states can come with a, a very repressive uh, uh, politics. 
and then somebody else. I don't know if you want to add, uh, add Ben, something. Sean is asking if the strategies can be uh, blended. Um, I mean, in a sense, what we are arguing that is that they can't be blended to a significant extent as you go down the 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 columns, precisely because uh, the the distribution of political power and 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 actors and the questions of redistribution become increasingly more pressing. So the blending is not possible because certain things are simply not possible. You can't have. And I know somebody else said, well, didn't we have two years of very significant? Um, uh, sort of state responses and de-risking uh, and central bank interventions, but you can see the backlash to that. That is, to me, very. it was a very exceptional period. I called it a revolution without revolutionaries. And actually, the, the counter movement now, with a little bit of inflation, is, to my mind, if you read the political economy of the moment we live just now, it's that the, the, the contractionary forces uh, are very significant. And, and we are looking at a, a at recessions, to my mind, um, uh, very close uh, by. But but yeah, I don't know. Ben, maybe I'll, I'll I'll finish with this. Maybe you want to finish yours, and then we let everybody go home. Um, yeah, I I don't think I uh, can add very much uh, anymore. Now there are more uh, questions coming in. Um, yeah, feel free to tackle anything any of the questions or any make any final comments. I agree with the comment by Arian about asset manager capitalism and public goods. That is, of course, also Daniela's Wall Street consensus. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'll just uh, also I, I agree with the comment by uh, Colleen who points out that yeah, degrowth advocates would only call a, an orderly uh, degrowth process degrowth and mm -hmm. not the deorderly version that that makes total sense um so yeah um i think we maybe can can wrap up because we are over time uh right um i mean if there's anything else that you really wanted to get to more than happy to but we have definitely probably taken up more than enough of your time so if you're happy to great. Leave it there. thank you yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for such a wide ranging discussion. So much interesting discussion in the chat as well. Could see some um, some connections being made. Um, but yeah, no, thanks so much again for coming. Virtual round of applause. Um, and yeah, please, everybody have a good evening. Again, you can sign up to our mailing list for future events, which are a little bit similar, a little bit different. And yeah, have a great evening. Thanks again to our speakers. And we shall see you all another time, hopefully. Good night. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, everyone. Great questions. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.